Well, uh, hello everybody. Uh, you're very welcome on behalf of Dublin City Council, uh, Dublin City Libraries and the Dublin City Council Culture Company to this, the second event in our big weekend here at the Dublin Festival of History. Uh, some of you may have been here earlier on, but for those who have just arrived to say this is our 11th year, and City Council is delighted with the success of the festival, which is due in one part to the great team that we have, the people going around in the t-shirts and that, and doing a great job, but also the fantastic audiences we have who show such enthusiasm for the various events we put on. And don't forget we have more events uh, on the programme to come over, the next, uh, over this weekend and indeed over the next couple of weeks, so keep an eye on the website dublinfestivalofhistory.ie. We had a return speaker, our, pre our first speaker there at six o'clock, and I'm delighted to be welcoming back again a speaker who has been with us before, both uh, in real life, uh, back in the good old days, and in the interregnum uh, online. And he's accompanied by a man who was with us online the last time. So it's really a great pleasure to have them back. Uh, they're a great, uh, great double act, uh, uh, talking about a very serious subject, but one that uh, we're still living with the reverberations of it in uh, Europe and indeed the world today. So will you please give a warm Dublin welcome to Frank McDonough and Paul McGowan. I am delighted to be here with uh, Frank McDonough to talk about his new book. When, when did it come out? A couple of weeks now. Um, 31st of uh, August. Flying up the charts. Yes, done really well. Done really well. Yeah. The Weimar Years, Rise and Fall. This is the third um, volume in Frank's comprehensive narrative history of Germany from 1918 to 1945. The previous two volumes entitled The Hitler Years, Look at the period when Adolf Hitler ruled the country, the first of which, Triumph, starts with his accession to power in 1933, ends after Germany's invasion of Poland in 1940, and the second volume, Disaster, begins with his military victories in Western Europe in 1940, ends with the Germany's catastrophic defeat in 1945. This is a prequel safe to say. And this looks at the years of Germany's experiment with democracy. It's the, it, German, it's the narrative story of Germany becoming a democracy. And how the, really the failure of that democracy leads to the rise of Adolf Hitler. Each of the three books Frank writes in a chronological style. So every chapter is, looks at a calendar year in detail. And I think this, more than anything, makes them immensely readable. And you can take my word for that, because I read the audiobooks. I've read them all for audiobook. Frank, welcome. I suppose a good place to start, um, particularly for anyone here that's uh, perhaps never studied the period. What is or was the Weimar Republic? Well, the Weimar Republic was the government that ruled Germany from 1918 to 1933. So it's the period after the Kaiser abdicates in November 1918, but before Hitler comes to power in January 1933. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of tragic period, really, because Germany becomes a democracy and, in many ways, the most far-reaching an innovative democracy in Europe in, in many ways. And this is snuffed out, really, in 1933 by uh, you know, Hindenburg appointing Hitler as the chancellor. So it's a fascinating period. I think people probably may know it through things like Cabaret, yeah. the, the film with uh, Liza Minnelli, or Babylon Berlin. Um, but they probably don't know anything about the politics of Weimar anything about the Reichstag. And this book sets to put that record straight. It is really a political history of Weimar. So it looks at all the governments, you know, the many coalition governments. There were 20 coalition governments 
In 13 years. In 13 years, yeah. There were, there were uh, eight, 12 chancellors and there were eight national elections. So, you know, imagine a series of governments led by Liz Truss that, yeah. <laughs> that went on for four years. Since 2010, <laughs> yeah. or back 13 years. And just yes, as chaotic, by the exactly way. Exactly right. In many ways, more chaotic. But the political parties then, at the beginning um, of the Republic, I mean, were they, what were they? Were they reconstituted from the old order? Or well, I, think, they, I, think they, I think if I just explain what the previous government was like, the Kaiser's government, yes. really. The Kaiser was, you know, he was an autocrat, really, because he had a veto over parliamentary legislation. So if Parliament put through a law, he could, he could you know, he, he could get rid of it. Um, so the parties, the six main parties of Weimar sort of existed in the Kaiser right before 1914. The Social Democratic Party was the most popular. That was like a kind of party similar to the Labour Party in, in Britain. The, it wanted reform. <laughs> I suppose it's not like the Labour Party now. <laughs> it wanted reform, but within the, within the system. Um, and it had, a, it had an extreme left wing group called the United Social Democrats, the USPD. And amongst them were two you know, very famous uh, socialist thinkers, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. So there was the, 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 the socialist party was sort of split into these two groupings, really. Inevitably, they were going to fall out after 1918. And then there was the Catholic Center Party, and that was a party of basically people who believed in Catholicism. And interestingly enough, if you look at Weimar's electoral system and you have a graph of it, some of the parties go up and down. But the graph for the Catholic Centre Party stays the same. Catholics stayed loyal to the Centre Party. Even when Hitler comes on the scene, Hitler can't win votes against the Catholic Centre Party. So. That's kind of a bit of a, but he does win votes from Protestants, doesn't he? Nearly all the voters for Hitler before 1933 come from the Protestant majority. Um, so then there was the DDP, that was like a kind of liberal party. And in that party was a guy called Hugo Price and he designed the Weimar Constitution, which we'll come on to. Then there was the DNVP. Uh, I saw I said my book's full of acronyms, but it has to be, because you've got to understand these parties to understand why it, why it collapsed. That was the German Conservative Party. It was called the National People's Party. The National Conservative People's Party is very different from the British Conservative Party because the British Conservative Party sort of changes. It's like a chameleon. It changes its spots through, you know, each of its incarnations. And then, of course, you know, like it comes back to to power eventually. Um, and then there was the, the National People's Party, that was called the DVP. And that was led by a guy who was the most prominent politician of the Weimar period, a fellow called Gustav Stresemann. So they were, the main, they were the main parties that made up these coalitions, but the problem was that you needed four parties to form a coalition. And, and this was a real problem because they fell out over minor issues. A government could fall over a very minor issue. Um, and that, that was something that, that happened as well. So I would say that the German revolution of 1918, and they call it a revolution, it wasn't really a revolution at all, really, when you look at it more closely. Because, yes, they got rid of the Kaiser and it forced him to abdicate, and he went to live in exile in the Netherlands. Um, and it's thought that even in 1926, 27, that about 50% of the population would have happily had the Kaiser back. So that tells you something about how well this democracy was going. Um, and the number of people who voted for the pro-Republican parties, you know, uh, was 71% in 1919. But in 1932, 51% of the population voted for two extreme parties, the Communist Party and the National Socialist Party. Both those parties wanted to destroy democracy. 
the army was not purged, so the army stayed the same. The, the bureaucracy stayed the same. They, they were of the same mindset and the same social class as the people who ruled before 1914. And the judiciary didn't change. The judiciary was very right-wing. And during the Weimar period, it would punish left-wing rebels, um, you know, systematically and harshly. And it would let off, you know, um, right-wing people who tried to overthrow the state. Of course, Hitler got treated leniently by him, didn't he? He tried to overthrow the state. He ended up serving about 12 months in prison. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the, so the Constitution. I want to ask, why a, why a republic? I mean, was it, they were free to choose that. It wasn't imposed by the Allies. Or it was, yeah. Well, and and the, similarly, the Constitution, was, Freud writes the Constitution. It's it's sort of the Allies. I think Woodrow Wilson, he, he, he'd come up with these... 14 points on which peace would be based. And one of them was, you know, nations finding their own destiny and, and democracy. Right. He never said you have to have a, a democratic government, but it was kind of implied. They said they wouldn't have the Kaiser. Woodrow Wilson sent a letter to the German Chancellor and said, there's no way are we gonna have the Kaiser back uh, rule in Germany. He's gotta go. And so they, they sort of took that kept that in mind. And remember in 1918-19, they were looking for a lenient peace treaty. So they, were, they, were, they wanted to please the Allies in that way. Uh, of course, that led to the, the, the Versailles Treaty, which was a, a disaster, of course. Yeah. So then talk, perhaps talk us then through the, um, the, the Constitution, at least the, you know, those aspects of the, the Constitution. That... Well, the Constitution was decided upon by this guy called Hugo Price and a kind of committee, and it was proclaimed in August 1919 in the town of Weimar, hence Weimar, Weimar Germany. The reason being that Berlin was so tumultuous and there was <laughs> so much conflict in Berlin, they felt this was a safer place yeah. to, to enact the Constitution. The Constitution is very liberal, very open, made Germany one of the most, um, you know, forward-looking democracies in Europe. For example, uh, everybody o over the age of 21 had the vote in 1919. If you look at Britain, women under the age of 28 didn't have the vote at, at that time. Um, so that was, and they also brought in a kind of arbitration system now, we've seen all these strikes, haven't we? Maybe, I don't know what the situation is in Ireland, but in Britain, we've got all these. Every, basically, everyone's on strike. And, and the po point is that no one will negotiate. Well, the, the Weimar Constitution made it mandatory for the employer and the employee to have an arbitration. And then the arbitrator would, would rule on exactly what pay settlement would happen. So, so if, if the arbitrator said 8%, the employer had to accept it. So that was a great move forward for workers, really, getting the, you know, inflation-proof rises. Um, and also, you know, the, there was, uh, um, women had equal rights. They had the right to equal pay as well. Also, Jewish people had full equal rights for the, for the first time. Um, and it was a kind of, you know, it was, it was an enlightened government, you know, censorship was taken away. So this opened up the Berlin, opened up the Berlin nightclub scene, um, and and also you know gay people felt better about this regime as well because they sort of tinkered with the law, so that it sort of made it impossible to be sort of prosecuted for being gay the way they they tinkered with the law. There were famously now um, problems with the constitution. Or, pro or, or things about the constitution that later would lay down problems which... I, I think the, the designer of the constitution, he wanted to have checks and balances, so he looked to France, he looked to, to America, and he looked to Britain, and he wanted to have checks and balances on, on, on the ruler. So what he did was, he made the parliament sovereign. So remember I was telling you about uh, Kaiser Wilhelm. Parliament wasn't sovereign. He had a veto over parliamentary legislation. So what, what was done was um, they included Article 48 of the Constitution. Now, this was meant 
to help in a revolutionary situation, to help the president sort of counterbalance parliament if parliament took on, you know, too many powers. And, but it meant that, in effect, the president ruled over the armed forces and he, and he also really ruled over the country, really. He could suspend parliament if he wanted to. Yeah. And this was kind of a, a ticking time bomb. It wasn't a problem from 1918 to 1925 because the president was um, Friedrich Herbert, the social democrat, who was a pro-Republican. So if he used Article 48, it was to help preserve the Constitution. But then in 1925, the German people elected Paul von Hindenburg. He was one of the two major generals of the First World War. He was virtually a dictator with Eric Lutendorf during that war. So he comes to power and then he doesn't abuse Article 48 in the first five years. But when the economic crisis happens after 1929, he starts to use it to close down Parliament. Let me read a, a, a passage from the book. Um about this matter. The powers given to the Reich president were extensive and effectively compromised the power of the Chancellor and the Reichstag. Hugo Preuss wanted to create a strong president as a counterweight to the power of parliament. And he expected the president to perform duties in a non-partisan manner. But in certain circumstances, the constitution afforded the president unlimited power. The president appointed the chancellor and approved all cabinet posts. He was also made the commander of the armed forces with the exclusive power to make treaties and alliances. If a local state failed to fulfill its obligations under the constitution or Reich law, the president could use armed force to compel it to do so. The president was also given extensive subsidiary powers under the notorious Article 48 to appoint and dismiss elected governments and to use armed force and suspend civil rights during a time defined by the president as a national emergency. This turned out to be a dangerous anti-democratic weapon which allowed the president in principle to override the Reichstag, the Reichsrat and the federal states. It's often assumed President Paul von Hindenburg, who was elected by voters, abused Article 48 most flagrantly between 1925 to 1934. But Friedrich Ebert, elected by members of the National Assembly, used Article 48 on a staggering 136 separate occasions between 1919 and 1925. The substantial difference was that Ebert did not intend to destroy the Republic when he used this measure, whereas Hindenburg from 1930 onwards used Article 48 to pass legislation in defiance of the will of Parliament. In this sense, Article 48 offered little protection against the president who was hostile to the Constitution. It was not the intention of the architects of the Weimar Constitution to smooth the path towards a personal dictatorship, but the dangers of Article 48 offered that possibility from the very beginning. Like you say, a ticking time bomb. Yeah. Uh, it's like the American, you know, the American Constitution has sort of checks and balances, doesn't it? Yeah. It has the Congress, it has the President, it has the Senate, it has the Supreme Court. Um, and they had all them things in Weimar, but they, they didn't seem to work late on when the system came under pressure. Tell us about, because of course this, um, Germany loses the war and, and signs the Versailles Treaty. How did that, or the, the, the fallout from that, play into the politics, particularly in, in this early period? Well, in the early period, the early period of Weimar from 18 to 24, it's, it's, it's kind of tumultuous. So much is going on in the economy. So much is going on with revolutions and uprisings and so on. Staggering it's, it's staggering. It's, ama it's amazing that it survived in this early period. But really, sort of overhanging this early period was the Versailles Treaty. The Versailles Treaty was enacted in um, June 1919. And, you know, it introduced a number of things. It took 13% of German territory away. It seized all of Germany's foreign financial assets. So if you were a German and you had a bank account in London, it was seized. <laughs> You know, and, that, and, and, and Germany had problems with liquidity and getting loans, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
Also, it created a demilitarized zone. This was something the French wanted, so the Germans, you know, couldn't have a try for revenge straight away. This was in the Rhineland, right across the Rhineland was this demilitarized zone, and Germany was not allowed to send troops into that zone or any military equipment. In the east, there was something created called the Polish Corridor, which cut off East Prussia and turned Danzig, which had been a German port, into a League of Nations port as well. All Germany's colonies were, were taken away as well. But on top of that, this was the issue that really burned in this early period, was the demand by the Allies for reparations, compensation. The French government said, all of the war was fought in France and Belgium. All of our industry and our you know, infrastructure has been decimated. So Germany has to pay for this. They have to pay for what they did because they caused the war. So two clauses were introduced. One, that Germany would pay reparations. It was estimated that um, 132 billion until 1983 paid in tranches of 3 billion, plus 12% of Germany's exports, which actually amounted to a lot more than, than three, 3 billion. So they had to pay that. So it was kind of a burden, and they couldn't really comprehend it. It was like, what happened here? Why have we got this harsh treaty? In some way, they thought it was going to end like a, you know, a British cricket match, you know, where we'd all shake hands and we'd all go away. And, uh, you know, and, and, and say, oh, hard cheese, everyone, you know, you've been bad, we've been bad. And many wars ended like that. That was the way wars ended, with just not taking such a punitive approach. And this was a problem because Germany couldn't pay. <laughs> Their banks, I mean, now it's easy. In the world we live in now, any, basically any country, you know, even countries that are very possibly in the third world, they can still get bonds, they can still issue bonds, they can still raise money through those bonds, and then they can finance, you know, payments that they need to make. Germany could not get bonds from its own banks, because no one in Germany wanted to buy them. They were saying, we don't want to buy these bonds, they'll probably end up worthless. Nobody in the foreign markets wanted anything to do with these bonds. So Germany could not raise money on, on foreign markets. Now, this led to a rather strange situation. The French needed the money, and the schedule of payments was that they would get 70% of this money. They needed this money. The French needed it to rebuild, and they weren't getting it, and they became more and more frustrated because Germany wouldn't pay. Germany kept on saying, imagine, you know, you you've given your son a credit card and you know he's maxed out his credit card and he, he keeps asking you for a payment holiday this was germany germany was asking the the allies to give them a payment holiday and the allies did they kept giving them payment holidays and the french said look we've had enough of this these payment holidays where they never pay so what we're going to do is we're going to go and invade the ruhr and we're going to seize the commodities in the raw, and that's how they're going to pay. We're going to make them pay through, through seizing their commodities, and that's what they did. In January 1923, the French and the Belgians occupied the Ruhr. So what would be, what would be the, the uh, attitude of the German government? You know, would the German governments, you know, uh, go along with the occupation? Would they help the occupation? No, not at all. The German government said, we are instituting a policy of passive resistance to the uh, French and, and Belgian occupation. And this will consist of the government paying the workers in those areas not to work. A furlough scheme, <laughs> in effect, a furlough scheme that was costing 41 billion, sorry, 41 million marks a day. So this was dragging on. And so what did the Germans do? They decided, uh, and there's no evidence, the French said they're deliberately bankrupting their country, that's what they're doing, so that we'll give up on reparations. What did they do? They printed money. They, they, they had nearly 200 factories that just printed money. And so what they did was, when the inflation was going up and up and up, 
They just gave the workers inflation rises. The problem was it was going up too much with the, with the great inflation. I mean, Paul, have you, there's a, an extract yeah. about <clears throat> the great inflation. The hyperinflation. The economic consequences of the Ruhr occupation were escalating. Hyperinflation rose to stratospheric levels during 1923 and food prices surged. The market price of a loaf of bread was 700 paper marks in January, 1,200 in May, 100,000 in July, 2 million in September, 670 million in October, and 80 billion in November. In the month following the 20th of May, the cost of an egg rose from 800 paper marks to 2,500, a litre of milk from 1,800 to 3,800, and a kilo of flour from 2,400 to 6,600. All basic food items rose in a similar manner. Farmers were by now refusing to sell their produce for worthless paper money. Trucks and trains carrying food were frequently stopped and looted. As Germans battled hyperinflation, ridiculous situations became a routine part of daily life. A 5,000 paper mark cup of coffee in a cafe could cost 8,000 marks by the time it was drunk. Every German seemed to have a hyperinflation anecdote. One came from a Munich woman who dragged a suitcase full of paper marks to her local grocery store and left it outside while she went in to buy shopping. When she came back out, someone had stolen the suitcase <laughs> but emptied the worthless money onto the pavement. <laughs> Many Germans stopped using money altogether and began bartering with goods to get what they wanted. A lump of coal could gain entry to a cinema. A bottle of paraffin bought a shirt, and that shirt could buy some potatoes. Half a pound of butter could pay for a month's rent, rent on a flat. I mean, how was this, how was this remedies? How was... Oh, you can see why, you know, the, why the, the Allies was getting so frustrated with Germany, you know, how, how could they get out of this? In the end, Germany got a chancellor called Gustav Stresemann, he also became their foreign minister, and he said in his diary, unless we get on better with the French, we'll never get anywhere in the world. Germany's got to get on better with the French. If they can do that, then Germany can make its way in the world. Now, as we know, after 1945, that's what the two, Germany and France, did get together, and they formed, the, formed the common market. Now, back here, they were, they were at loggerheads all, all the time. But Stresemann said, look, Here's my solution. We will accept a, an independent inquiry into our ability to pay because we can't pay. And he said, if you get an American banker to be the chair of that committee, we'll accept the findings of it. And this became known as the Doors Plan to, to help pay German reparations. And it consisted of a number of things. First of all, the, he suggested they put a mortgage over all of Germany's railways and they issued bonds based on the railways. Now, these bonds were successful. People bought them because they were saying, well, we'll get 10% if we buy the bonds over a year. So that worked. Um, they introduced some sales taxes, but the most important part of it was the US Wall Street provided Germany with loans, short there were short-term loans, you know, kind of like roll-around loans that went on for about six months. But this stabilized the situation. And they also introduced a new currency called the Renton Mark. It was kind of a transition uh, currency through to the German Mark, which was then reintroduced in its new form. And that stabilized the situation. The inflation went away. <laughs> it was immediately went away. I don't think it would work now, but... It, it did work then because of, of the way the Doors plan was kind of constructed. Yeah, yeah. And so Germany then from 24 with, with Gustav Stresemann as the foreign minister trying to be nice to the Allies and especially the French, it did work because Germany did change its spots. So from being kind of the spoiled brat of Europe, Germany now became a conciliatory power. First of all, Stresemann signed the, the Locarno Treaties these were treaties where Germany accepted the Western frontiers, the demilitarization of the Rhineland. And this was seen, nobody thought Germany would accept that, that they would never be able to go back into the Rhineland with armaments. That was unheard of. 
Then he, saw, he, he took Germany into the League of Nations as well. So Germany was part of the kind of you know, international system that had been created by the Allies. And then Germany signed something called the kellogg brion Pact. And this pact renounced war as an instrument of policy. And the, and the London Times said, here is Germany signing a treaty that renounces war when Germany was primarily responsible for the First World War. This is an amazing development that's happened. So Stressman was a key factor. I call him the kind of Gorbachev. He's the Gorbachev of that period, really. Yeah, and if, if there's a kind of, I don't know, it seems silly to say a star of the book, but it's almost like he is, he's the major politician. I think so, yeah. I think the, 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 the draw of the book for me is the kind of story of Stressman, you know, because I looked at his, his papers and his diaries and they're kind of sad, really. I mean, even through the times when he's negotiating these treaties, he's very ill. He's got a, you know, he's got a bad heart and he's yeah. got all kinds of health problems. And he's always in a sanitarium. You know, the chancellor has to visit him in the sanitarium. And these are kind of poignant. You know, he seems like a man who's like 70 and in a care home, really. And then he gets off his bed and he goes to yeah. Paris and signs the Locarno Treaty. This is, uh, this is him to the League League of Nations making this speech. Was this perhaps even the last speech? That's his last yeah, speech, he, yeah, yeah. The German government has always adopted the stand that the starting point of all efforts for securing peace must be the extension of the methods for the peaceful solution of every kind of conflict between states. War will not be avoided by preparing a war against war, but only by removing its causes. The more we succeed in finding a practical way of settling existing and future differences between our states, the more we can realize the idea behind the model treaty for the avoidance of war drawn up at a German suggestion. Stresemann. Well, I mean, if you read that speech, you listen to that speech and listen to those words, it's ruling out rearmament. It's ruling out overturning the Treaty of Versailles by force. Mm. And that's what we got, didn't we, with Hitler in the 1930s. So, sadly, Gustav Stresemann dies. He dies on the 3rd of October, 1929. Um, and it's, it's a big loss for Germany because he did have influence over Hindenburg and over politics, and especially internationally, a huge influence. Perhaps this should leave the political sphere for a few minutes. Um, in, in all of the chapters in the book, you know, you're, you're mindful of the, you know, the, the cultural goings on, and you write beautifully, I think, about, you know, silent film and the theater scene and the cabaret scene. Perhaps talk us through, um, you know, what, what, what you thought of that. How, how important was the culture and, how, and what do we think of it now? Uh, I think that, you know, that's one of the attractions of Weimar. You've got sort of three things going on, haven't you? You've got this tumultuous set of, you know, arguments with the Allies in Germany. You've got the great inflation. You've got revolt. And at the same time, you've got a burgeoning cultural scene that is quite amazing. I mean, that's my, yeah. look at my T-shirts here with, this is, Metrop this is Metropolis. That's all too detailed. Yeah. <laughs> no, you think I'm joking? That is actually R2D. Too. Well, it will be. It will be. Yeah. But when you think of the influence of a film like Metropolis, I mean, has anyone ever seen Blade Runner? It's copied from Metropolis, or, or the Gotham City of the Batman films, yeah. right out of Metropolis. Um, and, and that was Fritz Lang. You know, Fritz Lang was an Austrian, um, and he made other films. M. That's a fantastic. Has anyone ever seen M? Fantastic film. It's uh, Peter Laurie. It's about Peter Laurie. Yeah. My arm got twisted. My arm, leave me alone. It's Peter Laurie um, as a child killer. Yeah. Uh, it's very, very good. And Hitler hated that film. He said, "This is everything that's bad about culture is in that film." He said. Um, and you know, other films. You know, The Blue Angel, which was very influential, Marlene Dietrich's first film. But it's very influential on cabaret, Eliza Minnelli. Uh, character. In fact, it's a better story, I think, the, the actual film. It stands up very well, because I was wa watching these films as well while I was, while I was writing the book. Um, and also, you know, sexual freedom. There was a guy called um, Magnus Hirschfeld, and he created an, in, an institute into the research into sex. 
And so he, 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 he sponsored the first gay film, different from others. And the plot of that film is a, is a, a black male, the black male of um, a professor over his student. The student has blackmailed him over the fact that he's got a gay relationship with him. And, and Hirschfeld, he, he sponsored that film. He also was, was against, um, he also wanted to decriminalize uh, gay people. He, the, the, the current thinking in the 1920s was that, you know, uh, being gay was a kind of mental illness, if you like, and he changed all that and he showed that it wasn't a mental illness, it was nothing to do with men mental illness at all. He was also, a, um, he wanted to uh, legalize abortion as well. Um, but, and this is where the, the caveats over Weimar culture come in, <clears throat> you know, he, he was like, you know, like these today, this thing about cancel you all heard about the cancel culture where there's a lecturer or someone with, with views that are sort of seen as beyond the pale and people want to cancel them, won't let them speak on their campuses. Hirschfeld was cancelled. He had to have, at many cases, he had to have a police escort to go and give lectures <coughs> at university. So it was contested. Culture was always contested. When you look at theatre, Bertel Brecht, yeah. um, you know, the Thripney Opera, um, the, you know, the, the, the one that introduced uh, uh, Mac the Knife, wasn't it? The song of Mac the Knife, which uh, Paul was you, were, you were trying to see the German translation, weren't you, for the audio yeah, yeah, yeah. book, yeah? Yeah. Um, and then there was, you know, film as well, the novels, you know, Thomas Mann, for example, looking into middle class life, critical of middle class life. Um, and then there was the, the most popular novel in Germany was All Quiet on the Western Front, and that was turned into a film. And the, the Nazis decided that they would try and boycott this film, so they, they tried to disrupt the premiere. They went there, they threw in live white mice uh, so the people would run out. Uh, they stink bombs as well. And after a week, <coughs> the German Film Censorship Board banned all quiet on the Western Front, and the Guardian in Britain said, this, this is a really dangerous, this was 1929, they said, you know, Germany's entered a very dangerous phase now. Having been the most open place in Europe, it's now battening down on censorship. Mm -hmm. And of course, there was, uh, you know, there was also um, the Bauhaus movement. Many of you will know about the Bauhaus movement. I have, of course, a conflicted, I do like many of the things that Bauhaus did, but some of the buildings were terrible, weren't they? I mean, <laughs> not for you. <laughs> they were. They were the. These were these uh, high-rise buildings. We all we all had to suffer thanks to Bauhaus after the after the Second World War. But there's some interest in them. They they popularized bungalows. Not very many people know that, but they did popularize bungalows, kitchen design, very sort of you know. Uh, it, the, the kind of kitchens that we have now, they, they popularized them in these show homes that they had. There were other things where they, there was, uh, they created, the, you know, in, in keeping with the egalitarian uh, mood of the age, they created a chess set that was egalitarian. There were no monarchical pieces in, in, the, in the chess <laughs> set. It's actually much harder to play. <laughs> you know, whereas you've sort of been beating your son a chess, if you have to bring this in, you find he might be beating you. Um, and there was the tea, in, the tea infuser, the Vasily Church. In fact, yeah. I would think this is not too far from a, of, yeah. from a distant cousin of the Vasily Church. You say the culture... Uh, like and the cabaret scene the, as well. But the great cabaret, yeah, the great cabaret With, scene. you know, a hundred nightclubs, uh, the cabaret scene. The cabaret scene... In Berlin. In Berlin, yeah, and you know there was a hundred lesbian clubs in, in in Berlin. That was more than the rest of the world put together. But you say it was, you know, the culture was contested. But this, but 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 is it also? Would that mean what that it wasn't for everybody or people? Or, or I don't know. It was like a bit like the swing in sixties. Well, didn't yeah. Happen round here, it happened down <laughs> in. Yeah, I think I think the culture of Weimar is the problem with. See, I always have this thing about you know the. Culture converge on nostalgia. So what can happen is we go to the 70s, don't we? we go, oh, look, Abba, they're fantastic. 
Look at the 70s. I wish I was alive in the 70s when ABBA were around because they were so open and free, wasn't they? What they don't tell you is that, you know, there was like a toilet paper strike. <laughs> you know, and then things didn't run effectively. There was, everything was on strike in the 1970s. I very much remember the toilet paper strike and my mum com coming back home. My dad was there and she said, there's no toilet paper. There's a strike. And, and this was kind of a low point, I think, in this. And other things, other things Never happened. the materialism. <laughs> So this, back to the politics, it's, it's of the second period, so to speak, yeah. after, the, after the madness and the violence of the first period. Well, he settled it all down, the 24 you know, to 29, Germany had settled down. There's optimism, you know, Germany's now in the lead. If you'd gone in your TARDIS back to, you know, 1929, you could have seen a good, you know, a, a society that seemed stable and you couldn't predict yeah. what was going to happen in such short space of time. And that's the other point, you know, Adolf Hitler doesn't enter my story until page 89 of this book. So I'm trying to show you that yeah. he wasn't an important figure. But for the most Weimar, part, he for was the a most part, fringe. fringe politician of the extreme right. No one took him seriously. He wasn't, this is the other misnomer, he wasn't very famous. Well, they tried to say, oh, the Munich Beale, which made him famous. It didn't. Nobody knew who he was. He doesn't feature, I've I feature the, the parliamentary debates. You can't find any reference to Hitler, hardly any reference to Hitler between 24 and 29. He, he doesn't exist. They're polling like 1%, 2% at national elections at most yeah, in this period. In 1928, the National Socialist Party polls 2.8%. That's 800,000 voters. That's all they've got in 1928. So what happens? What, what happens? This is the most important part of Weimar and one that's befuddled historians and psychologists and everybody else. Why did the Nazis break through? What, what was it? What was the reason they broke through? The conventional view is that there was the war... You've all been to school, haven't you? And, and, and everyone will tell you, it's always, it was the Wall Street crash that plummeted the German economy into terrible, you know, uh, depression, and that led to the rise of Hitler. Well, get, get, that, get those words, put them on a piece of paper, and, and eat them. <laughs> because it wasn't the Wall Street crash that, that brought Hitler to power. It was nothing to do with the Wall Street crash. What happened in Germany was the middle class were affected by the great inflation. And listen to this, the great inflation destroyed the savings of pensioners. 20% of the new voters who voted for Hitler in 1930 were pensioners. And 24%, because he breaks through in 1930, that's his big breakthrough in September 1930, he goes from 12 seats in the Reichstag to 107. He goes to 800 voters to 6.7 million, and they've suddenly voted for him at this election. But if you look closer, away from the Wall Street crash, you find that the great inflation affects these older people. They've lost all of their savings. And also, the middle class is, is starting to vote for all kinds of strange parties in, in the rural areas. Where does Hitler make his breakthrough? In the big cities? Well, most of you will say, yeah, that's where he makes his breakthrough, because Hitler was popular with the workers. It was called the German Workers' Party. He doesn't break through in the big cities. In fact, the unemployed, who were most affected by the Great Depression in the big cities, in the factories, they vote for the Communist Party. So if Hitler was, his message was getting through over the Wall Street crash, he should have been winning in the big cities. He wasn't. Where does Hitler win? Initially, where does he win? He wins in specific places. Protestant areas, where everyone's a Protestant. Self-employed, a vast amount of self-employed who are in those areas. He wins in, in towns with less than 5,000 populations. 
totally rural. He wins in totally rural areas where you've still got a middle class that does self-employment, you know, plumbers and electricians and that kind of thing. But he wins in those specific areas, and that's where his breakthrough comes from. Later on, he wins in affluent areas of the big cities. So I don't know what the, what's the big posh area of, of, of Dublin? Someone shout it out for me. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Dublin 4. Right. Dublin 4, that's going Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> and why does Dublin 4 go Nazi in 1932 when everyone's got a job? It goes Nazi because they're terrified that they're going to lose their job. He then starts to attract different people. He attracts the solid middle class now. He attracts doctors, teachers, amazing. Young people. Young people yeah. as well, students. Enormous amount of student support Hitler. They organise the book burnings. The students organise the book burnings for Hitler. Doctors, um, you know, uh, 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 office workers. He gets into office workers as well. They vote for him because they're terrified they're the next on the list of people who are going to lose their jobs. So the people who are in employment vote for Hitler, not the people who are out of work. So the depression... Is a, induces a fear factor. And that's the thing, isn't it, about, you know, it's a thing about... But the, at the core of the problem of Hitler is that now he's like, everyone's running around now, after 1930, everyone's running around like headless chickens in Germany. Now, what's going to happen? Hitler's going to come to power. How are we going to stop him? And Hindenburg decides that Hitler's appeal, and that's the other thing, if you look at Hitler's speeches... He doesn't mention the Wall Street crash at all. He mentions the political system doesn't work. There's too many political parties. There's coalitions that come. There's coalitions that go. They can't decide on anything. They can't, you know, they can't decide on how to change. That's where that phrase comes from. They can't decide how to change a light bulb. Mm. And, and he says that's the problem with Germany. So Hindenburg decides he's going to destroy democracy. And this is the other myth that Hitler destroys democracy. No. Paul von Hindenburg destroys democracy. He decides with a small group of people, it's amazing how a small group of sort of elite people can destroy a democracy, but this is what happened. Hindenburg has three or four advisors. One of them's called General von Schleicher. He's an army officer. The other is his own son, Oscar. The other is Otto Meissner. He's his kind of presidential secretary. Uh, and Franz von Papen, he eventually becomes the, the chancellor, right-wing baron. Um, and he decides that what he's going to do is, Schleicher says to him, you don't have to rule through parliament. You can destroy democracy if you want, using Article 48. And that is what he does. He doesn't do it in 1933. He does it in 1930. He decides whatever coalition comes to power, it will have no socialists in it, no members of the SPD, no members of the Catholic Centre Party. So he wants to create coalitions of the right. He's looking for a popular authoritarian government is what he's looking for. He tries, first of all, uh, Heinrich Brüning. He's a member of the Catholic Centre party. He's not the leader of a party, by the way. You know, he's, he's picked by, by Hindenburg that he'll be pliable. He introduces a, a, a program of austerity, terrible austerity. You know, you, you, we talk about austerity now, but you're talking here in Germany, pay cuts for everyone in the public sector of 19%. You know, this is proper, this is proper austerity, isn't it? And, you know, massive increases in sales taxes, taxing everything that moves, um, and it doesn't work. It just sends Germany more into a depression. Its growth goes down and down. It's got negative growth, um, you know. And then in the end, Hindenburg gets fed up with him. He's so unpopular. Um, you know, someone said he's, he's about as popular as an undertaker coming to <laughs> deliver a coffin. <laughs> and that's what he did. Every time he went to Reichstag, he was an undertaker delivering a coffin full of these horrible sorts of measures that were deflationary. But, it, but Hindenburg decides to get rid of him in 1932. Hindenburg 
beat Hitler in the 1932 presidential election. He stands, Hitler stands against Hindenburg, but there's a problem. All of Hitler's voters come from the center right. They come from the middle class center right voters. Uh, sorry, all of Hitler's voters come from the, the center right, and all of Hindenburg's voters come from the center left. So the center left are all voting for Hindenburg, and Hindenburg does win the election. He wins it by 19 million to 13 million. So you can see he was more popular than Hitler. And then there's a national election, and Hitler's vote goes from, um, you know, 19% in 30 to 30, the highest figure he ever got, 37.2%. That's 13 million people. And people ask you, you know, people will ask you, you know, uh, what does, does your vote count? Yes, it does. You know, a lot of people don't realize what they're doing when they go into that voting booth and put that X there. Your vote does count because if, if enough of you all vote for one person, he's put in a position where he can take power. And that's what happened here. The German population put Hitler in a position to be offered the chancellorship. If Hitler had never, never won those votes, he never would have been offered the chancellorship. It would have been easy to brush him aside. So the voters made a big vote. What's terrible to think, terrible I think, is that 13 million, 13 and a half million people voted for a party that said in its electoral platform, if it come to power, it would destroy democracy. They knew what they were voting for and they went along with it. And that's the tragedy of democracy. How do we protect ourselves? From ourselves. <laughs> because really in this case, it was protection from yourself, from the, from the voters. The voters were an enabler here to bring Hitler to power. And as we know, when Hitler got to power, he got more and more enablers, didn't he? He brought over millions and millions more people came over to Hitler quite gladly, by the way. You know, there wasn't any coercion after he came to power. Mm -hmm. Most people just joined in the party. 14 million, yeah, nearly 14, nearly 14 in a free million. vote. In a free vote, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But what, what's amazing about uh, uh, looking at when Hitler does, eventually all these presidential chancellors fail. So Hindenburg's in, in a dilemma. What am I going to do now? I, I need to have a popular authoritarian government. So Franz von Papen says to him, you've got to bring in Hitler. Hitler can provide the popularity none of us can provide. And he persuades him. He says, but if I bring him in, He'll create a one-party dictatorship in weeks. Why would I do that? He says, no, he won't. He says, uh, we'll control him. The conservatives will control him in the cabinet, he says. And within six months, he said, mark my words, we'll have him squealing in the corner like a mouse. Well, some mouse. And that mouse roared, didn't it? But the most amazing entry in a diary I saw in this period was a guy called Ernst Thalmann. He was the leader of the Communist Party, and he wrote in his diary on the 30th of January 1933, the, the same day Hitler comes to power as chancellor, and he says, he, said, he writes down, he says, uh, Hitler's going to become chancellor. He'll last three weeks. I'm off to Lichtenberg to play Skittles. Well, two weeks later, he's taken to a concentration camp and in 1944, Hitler orders his execution. It didn't pay to underestimate Hitler. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. It's all in your head, isn't it? No notes. <laughs> Love that. Um, Let's take some questions. I think there might be a, a, a roving, Where's roving, Mike? roving mic out there or two. Um, uh, this gentleman here in the front, the I think, was guy at the front here. Was first with his, his armor. It's roving mic. Hi, guys. Thanks. That was a great talk. I'll be quick as I can because I know other people are waiting. You're talking about the Versailles Treaty, and the Germans found it very unfair, and they were startled by its harshness. <laughs> 
Was there any reflection in Germany on the fact that they inflicted an equivalent treaty on the French in 1871, where they'd taken Alsace Lorraine, and there was massive reparations on the- Brest-Litovsk as well? Yeah, and the Russians too. The yeah, Russians, the Russians, yeah, Brest-Litovsk, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. Was there any reflection in Germany that this was, you know, payback or simply what they'd done to the other states? Well, some people have said that, you know, Germany suffered from amnesia, you know, full-blown amnesia after the First World War by not accepting the, the bad things they'd done in the war. They wouldn't accept the, the war guilt clause that, that made them responsible for the war, guilty for the war. And then after the war, collective amnesia, where they refused to face up to their Nazi past as well. Um. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, just a quick question. I just wanted to know what your thoughts on about the UK's phobia about adopting a, a PR as an electoral system and a written constitution. Is it because of what happened in Germany in the 1930s or is it I, just... I, I'm not sure. I think proportional representation has worked. You know, in many countries it has worked. Germany is a good example of that. They, they couldn't work a proportional representation system, you know, in, in, in the Weimar period, but they could work it later. Maybe it's the lesson, isn't it? The lesson of that period maybe resonated with people to, to make them think a proportional representation system. I think it's sort of, I don't know, I think it, even the people who were part of that system would say, we've got too many parties. If only we, people have said, you know, for a democracy to function well, you need two a two party system, not multiple parties. I mean, the good example, the British two party system doesn't work that well, by the way, because the Tories end up being in power 70% of the time. So it's not as if the other party gets the power. The other party gets the power and everyone goes, oh, I don't like these. Well, I'll go back to the Tories and that's happened, doesn't it? Massive, long periods of, of conservative rule and short periods of um, labor rule. Uh, America, America's, you know, we, we may say it about America and we may be critical about America, but America's got a pretty good two-party system because if you go back through the presidents, it's usually a Democrat followed by a Republican, followed by a Democrat, followed by a Republican, followed by a Democrat, followed by a Republican. So they alternate very well in the, in the American system. Um, I don't think it suited Germany at that time to have that kind of system. Maybe, but, but even so, in a first-past-the-post system, Hitler would have gained power in 1932 under a first-past-the-post system. So we couldn't have kept him from power. I think my view on it is this. A democracy needs safeguards. It needs safeguards to protect it from a possible extremist government. I mean, you know, we can look over in America, but, you know, Bush, uh, sorry, uh, Trump is actually saying that he's going to use the Supreme Court to, to, to put through an enabling act. He's mentioned the words enabling acts and things like that, you know, so he's actually, he's not going to come to power if he gets to power. He's not going to come to power accepting that political system as it exists. There's talk he's going to use an enabling act, the Supreme Court, shut down the Congress and the Senate, and then Trump rules by decrees, presidential decrees, just like Hindenburg did. So we need more protection for democracies. We need more protection for democracies. I always think the, the, the coup that happened in 1920 is interesting. But there, it was the workers who saved the Weimar Republic. They went out on strike. They had a general strike when, when the army sat on the fence. So I think, I think the lesson of Weimar is that it's a tragedy, really, because as you read through it, you can sort of see it coming. It didn't have to be Hitler. It just had to be this disillusionment. There was disillusionment. Why did we introduce this stupid system? Because it doesn't work. They didn't think it worked. Democracy never became popular. Uh, and the best example of that is in 1950, no, in 1932, 51% of voters were voting for parties that wanted to destroy democracy. You're not in a good place there. 
Thank you, Professor. Robin Mai. <coughs> Uh, sorry, you mentioned there that uh, Hitler got 107 seats in 1930. Yeah. The communists also got 77. That's right. Had the communists and the socialists worked together, would they have been an alternative? There might have been. There was a way to. There was a way to defeat Hitler, and that was to get the communists with the social democrats and the Catholic Centre Party, and you probably could have kept Hitler out of power if those three could have could have worked together. The communists wouldn't work with the Social Democrats, mainly because of the 1919 Spartacus Revolt, which was put down by the Freikorps, this right, these right-wing kind of, like a Wagner group, if you like, of that period. Um, you know, and and the, they said that Herbert was a social fascist. They wouldn't work with him. So there was prob possibly a way through there. But of course, Hindenburg didn't want a, a government of, of, the, of the left, did he? So, it's going to be hard to get that through Hindenburg. Working? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask uh, how important would you say Hitler was in determining the course of the Nazi regime? So, would the Nazis have gained as much power if Hitler himself wasn't directly in charge? So, how, how important was his like, cult of? Personality. Well, I think that, you know, if you look at why Hitler came to power, you know, one, one, of the, one of the key factors was propaganda. And propaganda was controlled by Goebbels, Joseph Goebbels. And you'd have to say that he was a bit of a mastermind of electioneering. You know, what he did was, was amazing. He created the Speaker's Bureau. And, he, and he, what he did was he created little Hitlers who would go into these little towns with film shows. And that's reckoned how the breakthrough came for the Nazi party through this kind of targeted propaganda. He would find out whether you were, you know, if you were a teacher or whatever, he'd then target the propaganda or leaflet and he created it just for you. Mail shots. The mail yeah. shot, he, was, he had index cards back then. Imagine yeah. what he'd have been like now. So I think Nazi yeah. party. Mr. Algorithm. The Nazi party's propaganda was very important in, in breaking through. Um, and it's kind of feeling of, that, of it being a movement, you know, that it wasn't, Hitler made the point that the Nazi party wasn't a party. It was a movement. It was a psychological feeling. And I think the, the best example of that is Albert Speer. He said that, you know, he, he saw Hitler and he, he felt he joined the Nazi party, he said, because he thought Hitler is so passionate about what he believes in. But then Speer, after, after 1933, Speer recounted the time when he, he, he went to see Hitler speaking and he said he was in the wings. And uh, then he saw how much of an actor Hitler, Hitler was and that, you know, and, he, and all this was because of choreographed, you know, all this passion and all the rest of it. And he said he came off, he knew that when he came off stage because he lifted up his glass of water and he said to Speer, how did that go? <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's the, you know. Can you talk about the nature of the mass media in the period? Um, I think that I, I mentioned it with, with, with the propaganda. Yeah, mass media was growing, you know, film, obviously film was growing at that time. New, newspapers, leaflets, you know, leafleting, you know, leafleting. And of course, you know, the films themselves, you know, visual, vis, that's what one thing about Nazi uh, propaganda. It was incredibly visual. And the left had great propaganda. There's some fantastic, you probably, John Hirschfeld, these uh, sorts of uh, things about Hitler being paid, the, at the back of Hitler was, was capitalism, and there's all these fantastic uh, uh, propaganda posters of Hitler taking, you know, taking money and then an x-ray of him, he's full of money, you know, g given by these capitalist donors. I think we've time. One more, I think, folks. Um, one more question. Is it going to be this hand up here? Okay. Hi, I was wondering, would you consider Germany as a whole at that time to be relatively socially progressive and then that was sacrificed with the election of Hitler and hyperinflation? Or would you say that that was only reflective of a very, kind of a few people? You have the change of the Article 175, but 
largely benefiting kind of middle class gay people who kind of fit in with society. And you also have the VD Act, who, which was, you know, the CCP was arguably not very socially progressive at all. Yeah, I think that, I think that, it, that, it, that it was segmented, you know, I think that it's too easy to make generalizations about Germany in the 1920s. Obviously the middle class, we're not, we're not very favorable to this sort of progressive culture. The, the people who were were on the left, and most of the progressive culture, be it you know, the, the nightclubs or Bauhaus or what, they were supported by social democratic local, local governments. I mean, Bauhaus is a good example. It, you know, it was in Bauhaus originally. It was thrown out of there because they got a right-wing government. Moved to Dessau, thrown out of there because that got a right-wing government. So it was always contested. It's a bit, you know, like the, the summer of love. You know, it's like, it was, you know, I can tell you, 1967, there was no summer of love down my road. <laughs> <laughs> it was my dad telling me to go to the barbers and get me hair cut, and me saying, but I want my hair long like the Beatles. <laughs> it's like, we don't want to have your hair long like the Beatles. Nothing good will come of that. So I think it, it was contested all the time. I think it was like, you've got to segment it out. It wasn't like everyone, like the, the, I suppose the best example of the myth is the cabaret scene. The cabaret scene was in Berlin, mainly in Berlin. It wasn't in these, in these small rural areas, you know. No, there, was no, um, there was no Marlene Dietrich in these areas. There were no nightclubs in those areas as well. Interestingly enough, another point I didn't make, but... In those areas Hitler first broke through, those rural areas, there were no Jews either. Anti-Semitism didn't need to play in those areas. There were no Jews there. So they didn't have a big emphasis on anti-Semitism in their initial breakthrough. Okay. Is that? I think that's, the that's the end. Thank you so much, folks, and thank you. <laughs> Once again, Professor Frank McDonough. Well, uh, folks, uh, Frank will uh, be happy to sign uh, a books uh, afterwards. Uh, and uh, as you know, the bookshop is there. And uh, I hope many of you will join us again tomorrow for a fantastic program tomorrow, uh, starting tomorrow morning. All the details from the program are on DublinFestivalHistory.ie. And just remains to thank once again Paul McGann and Frank McDonough.